we are in this borderland that it's usually, you know, like, don't talk about it. We don't want to hear that, you know? So, when I was uh, my first year, when I migrated to this land, I met this man, Jimmy Santiago Baca. He went to my high school and he was signing up books and, you know, I didn't have much knowledge about authors, about writers, and they just said it's a really controversial writer, you know, you should go. So I came across the blackness of homes and immigrants in our own land, this book that I have, and it brought me, it brought me memories because when I tried to do research, I remember going to the public library and they didn't allow me to get a library card because I was a document. So that was a very limited to get knowledge, you know, to, to find about this author. So I'm actually looking to this poem and I'm kind of going to do it. So. So Mexicans are pickings are our jobs from Americans. That's what it's called. Oh yes? Do they come on horses with ripples and say, Ese gringo, give me your job? Do you gringo pick up your rings, drop your wallet into a blanket, spread over the ground and walk away? I hear Mexicans are taking some jobs away. Do they sneak into a town at night? And as you're walking home with a horse? Do they mock you, an eye on your throat, saying, I want your job? Even on TV, an asthmatic reader crawls through a heavy, leaning on an assistant, and from a nest of wrinkles on his face, a tongue paddles through flashing waves of light bulbs of cameramen rasping, they're taking our jobs away. Well, I don't know about trying to find them, asking just where the hell are these fighters? The ripples I hear sound in the night are white farmers shooting blacks and browns whose ribs I see jutting out and starving children. I see the poor marching for a little work. I see small white farmers selling out to clean-suited farmers living in New York who've never been on a farm. Don't know the look of a hoof or the smell of a woman's body bending all day long in the fields. I see this. I hear only a few people got all the money in the world, the rest couldn't their pennies to buy bread or butter. Below the cold green sea of money, millions and millions of people fight to live, search for pearls in the darkest depths of their dreams, hold their breaths for years, trying to cross poverty to just having something. The children are dead already, we're killing them. That is what America should be saying on TV, in the streets, in offices, should be saying, we aren't giving the children a chance to live. Mexicans are taking our jobs, they say instead. What they really say is, let them die, and the children too. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Nico Gonzalez. Um, I'm also undocumented and uh, I moved here from Chicago uh, not so long ago and uh, there's many beautiful people here and knowing that we have a night like this to, uh, and remember right, why we're here and all these books and all these laws that exist and um, people like me and you know, are targets of, of the government. So I'm reading something. Um, it's called And Justice for All, an Oral History of the Japanese-American Detention Camps. Just kind of to reflect on what's happening nowadays. Um, and this might have happened in the 40s, but it's happening today all over this country. By Labor Day 1942, when we were to be moved inland to Idaho, I guess I was beginning to feel that I had no choice. I had to quit being so angry and to quit being so hateful. I had a job to do with my brothers, and I ran them like a drill sergeant. And people who met me in those years smile and laugh and talk about it now. They say, Helen ran those boys like she was a drill sergeant. I wouldn't let them be out after 9 o'clock. I made them go to school. I made them study. I made them. You know, I, I had them help me scrub their clothes so that they would be clean. And somewhere during that time, I came to feel, well, we're going to show these people. We're going to show the world. They are going to do this. They are not going to do this to me. Nobody's going to make me feel this miserable. 
The United States government may have made me leave my home, but they're going to be sorry. You know what I mean? I came around to feeling that nobody's going to do this for me. I'm going to prevail. My will is going to prevail. My own life will prevail. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to prevail. I'm also reading from People's History of the United States and about the Native Americans. The chief source, and on many matters the only source, of information about what happened on the islands after Columbus came is Bartolome de las Casas, who as a young priest participated in the conquest of Cuba. For a time he owned a plantation on which Indian slaves worked, but he gave that up and he became a vehement critic of Spanish cruelty. Las Casas transcribed Columbus's journal and in his 50s began a multi-volume history of the Indians. In it, he describes the Indians. They are agile, he says, and can swim long distances, especially the women. They are not completely peaceful because they do battle from time to time with other tribes, but their casualties seem small and they fight when they're individually moved to do so because of some grievance, not on the orders of captains or kings. Women in Indian society were treated so well as to startle the Spaniards. Las Casas described sex relations. Marriage laws are non-existent, he says. Men and women alike choose their mates and leave them as they please, without offense, jealousy, or anger. Without offense, jealousy, or anger. They multiply in great abundance. Pregnant women work to the last minute and give birth almost painlessly. Up the next day, they bathe in the river and are as clean and healthy as before giving birth. If they tire of their men, they give themselves abortions with herbs that force stillbirths, covering their shameful parts. Now notice, Las Casas says, shameful parts. The Indians say with leaves or cotton cloth, although on the whole, Indian men and women look upon total nakedness with as much casualness as we look upon a man's head or at his hands. They're extremely generous with their possessions and by the same token covet the possessions of their friends and expect the same degree of liberality. And then just a bit of Eugene Debs, who strongly opposed World War I and was sent to prison for his convictions. He says, wars throughout history have been waged for conquest and plunder, and that is war in a nutshell. The master class has always declared the wars. The subject class has always fought the battles. I've been accused of obstructing the war. I admit it. Gentlemen, I abhor war. I would oppose war if I stood alone. I have sympathy with the suffering, struggling people everywhere. It does not make any difference under what flag they were born or where they live. We are about to land this ship. Um, so we have three more, three more readers, uh, Sherry, Jody, and Ethan. Um, Sherry, Jody, and Ethan, and if you can make your way up here, and we will close our selection with the wonderful, wonderful Salvador. Stick around for that, folks.
Hello, my name is Sherry Gonzalez, and what I have to say is that I'm a woman of passion and expression, so I picked uh, an excerpt from Like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel. As you see, within our bodies, each of us has the elements needed to produce phosphorus. And let me tell you something, I've never told a soul. My grandmother had a very interesting theory. She said that each of us is born with a box of matches inside us, but we can't strike them all by ourselves. Just as in the experiment, we need oxygen and a candle to help. In this case, the oxygen, for example, would come from the breath of the person you love. The candle could be any kind of food, music, caress, word, or sound that engenders the explosion that lights one of the matches. For a moment, we are dazzled by an intense emotion. A pleasant warmth grows within us, fading slowly as time goes by until a new explosion comes along to revive it. Each person has to discover what will set off those explosions in order to live since the combustion that occurs when one of them is ignited is what nourishes the soul. That fire, in short, is its food. If one doesn't find out in time what will set off these explosions, the box of matches dampens, and not a single match will ever be lighted. If that happens, the soul flees from the body and goes to wander among the deepest shades, trying in vain to find food, to nourish itself, unaware that only the body it left behind, cold and defenseless, is capable of providing that food. How true these words were. Nobody knew it better than she. Unfortunately, she had to admit that her own matches were damp and moldy. No one would ever be able to light another one again. The saddest thing was that she knew what set off her explosions, but each time she had managed to light a match, it had persistently been blown out. As if reading her thoughts, John went on. That's why it's important to keep your distance from people who have frigid breath. Just as their presence can put out the most intense fire with the results we're familiar with, if we stay a good distance away from those people, it's easier to protect ourselves from being extinguished. Taking one of Tita's hands in his, he added simply, there are many ways to dry out a box of damp matches, but you can be sure there is a cure. Tita felt, Tita felt tears run down her face. Gently draw, John dried them with his handkerchief, you must, of course, take care to light the matches one at a time. If a powerful emotion should ignite them all at once, they would produce a splendor so dazzling that it would illuminate far beyond what we can normally see. And then a brilliant tunnel would appear before our eyes, revealing the path we forgot the moment we were born, and summoning us to regain the divine origin we had lost. The soul ever longs to return to the place from which it came, leaving the body lifeless. Ever since my grandmother died, I have been trying to demonstrate this theory scientifically. Perhaps someday, someday I will succeed. What do you think? Dr. Brown remained silent to give Tita time to say something, if she wished. But she was as silent as a stone. Well, I mustn't bore you with my talk. Let's take a breath, but before we go, I'd like to show you my show you a game my grandmother and I used to play. We spent most of the day here and she taught me her secrets to games. She was quite a woman, just like you. Sitting in front of her stove, her heavy braid wrapped around her head, she was always able to read my thoughts. I wanted to learn how to do it, so after much begging, she gave me my first lesson. She would write a sentence on the wall, using some invisible substance without my seeing. When I looked at the wall at night, I would find what she had written. Do you want to try it? From what he'd said, Tita realized that the woman she'd sat with so often was John's dead grandmother. Now she didn't need to ask him. The doctor took a piece of phosphorus in a rag and gave it to Tita. I don't want to break the rule of silence you have imposed, so as a secret between us, I'm going to ask you to write the reason you won't talk on the wall right over there as soon as I leave, all right? Tomorrow, I will divine the words before your eyes. What the doctor neglected to tell Tita, of course, was that one of the properties of phosphorus was that it would glow in the dark. 
revealing what she had written on the wall. He had no real need of this subterfuge to know what she was thinking, but he thought it would be a good way for Pipa to start communicating with the world again, if only in writing. John could see that she was ready. When the doctor left, Pipa took the phosphorus and went up the wall. To that night, when John Brown entered the laboratory, he was pleased to see the writing on the wall in firm phosphorescence letters, because I don't want to. With those words, Tita had taken her first step towards freedom. Meanwhile, she was staring up at the ceiling, unable to think of John's words. So it was possible for her, so was it possible for her soul to stir again? With her whole being, she wanted to believe it was. She had to find someone who could kindle her desire. Could that someone be John? She was remembering the pleasant sensation that ran through her body when he took her hand in the laboratory. No. She wasn't sure. The only thing she was actually absolutely sure about was that she did not want to return to the ranch. We want Jody and Ethan. Jody, is Jody still here? Jody. Okay. Then Ethan. 